Well, good morning and uh, welcome to Calvary. Glad you guys are here. My name is Dan. If you're joining us uh, well, here in the auditorium or there in the video venue room or those of you who are watching online, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching online, make sure that you fill out your connection card. Let us know you're here. Write down your prayer request. Stay in touch with us. We look forward to having everybody back on campus, hopefully soon, but uh, we're, we're glad to be here and here. How's that? Yeah. Um, as I shared a couple of weeks ago, I've uh, never been more excited to be at church than I am right now. So uh, hopefully you are too. If you have a Bible, you want to open up to the New Testament book, 1 Thessalonians. Open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're actually going to be studying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, but we're going to hop, skip, and jump as we go. Uh, I've been gone the last couple of weeks. My daughter Abigail got married two weeks ago, and so we've been, we've been out, and, and uh, thank you for that, but uh, it, it's just really glad that you know, Jeremy was able to step in and did, I think, a great, great job, so, so that was very cool. A couple of things very quickly. First of all, thank you to those of you who came out yesterday and help clean up the new facility. As uh, we've been sharing, we're moving very close to being able to move in. And uh, what needed to take place yesterday, which did take place, is everything had to be mopped up. All of the dust had to be removed because tomorrow they're kicking on the air conditioners. And once the air conditioners go on, all the cabinets can go in, all of the furniture can go in, the flooring can go in. So we are very close to moving in. Thank you for your participation. Continue to pray, and we're looking forward to that taking place. But thanks for those of you who were there yesterday. It was a great help. One other thing, uh, as we uh, not to reiterate everything that was in the announcements, but we're taking the next three days to spend some time in prayer and fasting. If you can join us, we'd love to have you participate. Some will take the whole three days. Some it will be a meal. Uh, others will just have a, a time of, of uh, more focused prayer. We're going to come together on Wednesday night, and we're going to share a meal together after we have a time of prayer and worship together. So uh, you're invited to be there. Let us know that you're going to be there because uh, we're going to take three days to pray and fast. Uh, that can only mean that this is going to be Hot Dog Sunday. You want to bulk up before you, you take the next... That's what I do. Is, is that wrong? <laughs> All righty. Well, how's everybody doing today? Good. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to share something today, and I have to tell you that I've never been more nervous uh, about what I'm going to share than, than I am today. So with a, a lot of fear and trepidation, there's a, a part of this that's very awkward. Are you okay with a little bit of awkward today? So it won't be mean, it won't be weird, it just might be a little bit uh, awkward as we, as we go. So I'm preempting you for that. So if you would indulge me just a little bit, as we've been saying this year, because of the things that we're seeing take place in our world, we've been focusing this year on what the Bible calls the last days, the end times, and, and what the Bible says about all of that. So we've been looking at that, we've been looking at faith, and what does it mean to actually walk in faith and to believe God for being you know, more than just nice people and, you know, good people, which is why we chose to study through the book of First and Second Thessalonians. And the reason for that is that the end times is a major theme of these two books. There, there's a very condensed amount of Bible prophecy. So we've been looking at that. And so over the course of the last few months, we've been looking at what the Bible says about end times, and we've referenced time and time again how God spoke and said that the nation of Israel would become a nation again, and that would begin what we might say the, the final generation. We look where Jesus talked about that. And uh, I know some of you have been writing on your connection cards. Could we take some time and point to those places that talk about that? When we get to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to stop and, and highlight that. But Israel, as you've heard me say so many times before, is the only nation on the planet in the history of the world that was a nation, ceased to be a nation in 70 AD, and was not a nation until 1948, just as the Bible said. So we've been talking about that. And uh, we, we've mentioned uh, many times, we've been in Matthew 24, and if you would just indulge me one more time to, to just highlight Matthew 24 very quickly, there on your outline, 
And uh, you'll recall that this is a couple of days before Jesus goes to the cross. He said some things that have really taken the disciples by surprise. And uh, it says, now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus is going to take two chapters to answer those three questions. And one of the things that we've highlighted each time is that when they ask those three questions, you know, the sign of your coming and the end of the age, Jesus doesn't respond by saying, don't focus in on that. That's not really important. It all pans out in the end. There's so many other things to talk about. But we've noticed how Jesus responds to that. And he says there in verse 4 of that chapter, he says, and Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Other translation says, don't be misled. And uh, so this is something that's very important to him. And so he talks in that chapter about Israel becoming a nation. And then he also describes, he says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See See to it that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But that is not yet the end for nation. And we highlighted how that word is ethnos will rise against nation, ethnos against ethnos, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine, and what's that word there? Pestilences, you want to underline that, and earthquakes in various places, and all these things are the beginning of birth pangs. And, and, and so Jesus talks about how uh, there's going to be like this long pregnancy, you might say, and it's been about 2,000 years, but there comes a certain point, just like a pregnancy, as you get into that last generation, and he likens it to, to birth pangs. You have this long pregnancy, and all of a sudden, just before the birth, you have these birth pangs, these contractions, and as you get closer and closer to the birth, those become closer and closer together and more and more intense. Uh, ladies, am I understanding that correctly? Is that pretty much how it goes? And, and, and so we're seeing those things. And then he highlighted some of those things. He, he highlighted that there would be earthquakes in various places. And, and uh, we mentioned how in our lifetime, we'd never seen a tsunami. And, but in 2004, for the first time in our lifetime, we actually saw that take place. But, you know, and, and we were devastated by that. But, you know, that was on the other side of the world and, you know, those things. But then in 2011, once again, in Japan. And so we're seeing things that have have not really been seen, uh, at least not that close and that extreme, you know, in the last couple of thousand, couple of thousand years. And he talks about famines and pestilences. And this is the first time where our whole world has been shut down essentially by a pestilence. He talks about how nation would rise against nation, but that word is ethnos. We'd say ethnic. And, um, you know, one of the things we've said is that in our world, just about the time that we think that we have this whole racial thing figured out, all of a sudden it erupts again. And Jesus says, that's just going to be kind of the sign of the end times. But then he also went on to say that, you know, on the other hand, while these things are going on, they're on your outline, same chapter, same Matthew 24. He says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For they were eating and they were drinking, and I've underlined marrying and giving in marriage. And he says, there will be two men In the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and one will be left. And we've talked about how that's a picture of what the Bible calls the rapture of the church. But as we talked about birth pangs, you have on the one hand, you have these birth pangs ramping up, but then also it looks like business as usual in an unusual time, as we've said. And uh, so we see these things going on in our world, but tomorrow for the most part, we're going to get up and go to work. And so we've said business as usual in an unusual time. So just to highlight this, I shared with you a few moments ago that my daughter Abigail got married a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I want to just show you a a picture or or so. Um, She went to get her wedding dress. And if we can put the first picture up. And so she goes to the the bridal shop to do that, and every you have mommy and Abby and Emma on the my other daughter, one of my other daughters on the, on the other side, and uh, who would have ever thought that when you go to buy a wedding dress, you'd have to be wearing a mask to do that, you know? And, and uh, so let me just show you the the next picture here. 
So there she is in her wedding dress and, and uh, very beautiful, wearing a mask. And, and uh, if anybody can look that good in a mask, that's, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> so uh, at the wedding, we didn't wear masks. So let me just show you one more photo there of her wearing. Yeah, it's pretty beautiful, right? I, I, I just want to stop and say, I made that. <laughs> uh, the one on the right. <laughs> I didn't make the one on the left. Somebody else made that, but, but I should get like a PhD in art, you know. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> but you and I live in a very unique generation where things are taking place. Israel has become a nation again, and we're seeing things that have never taken place. Well, we have been working our way through 1 Thessalonians. And now the reason, as I said, uh, once again, these books have some of the most condensed end times prophecy that you'll find anywhere in the New Testament. So this, this book is all about living in the last days. And each chapter, as we've said, ends with a reference to Jesus coming back. So if you would just indulge me once again and go to chapter one and notice verse 10, and it says they, they become believers to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. So we're waiting for Jesus, and uh, he's coming back for us. And then chapter 2, if you go to verse 19, he says, for who is our hope, our joy, our crown, our exaltation, of exaltation rather, is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Once again, a reference to him coming back. If you go to chapter 3, and you go to verse 13, he says, that, so that he might establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And then you go to chapter 4, and in verse 17, it talks about this event that's known as the rapture of the church. And uh, I put that verse there on your outline once again. If, if uh, we just go through it one more time. In verse 17, it says, Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. And that word there from the Latin, rapiamur, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Uh, that's from the Latin translation, which was the only Bible for over a thousand years. So that word in English means caught up, or we say rapture. That's where that word comes from. So this is teaching the rapture of the church. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so that we will always be with the Lord. And so that's where that teaching comes from. Now, if you would just indulge me one more time because I won't be able to do this too many more times, but would you go to chapter 4, verse 13? In chapter 4, verse 13, as Paul talks about this, this event called the rapture of the church, he begins by saying in verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed brethren as he goes into this teaching. So the first thing that we've highlighted each time that we've come there is, is that this is important. And Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed about this. And then you go down to verse 15 and you notice he says, for this we say to you, by the word of the Lord that we who are alive, that's that last generation, and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So here he says, guys, I'm telling you this is coming from the Lord. I'm not making this up. I don't want you uninformed, and this is coming straight from the Lord. Then you go to verse 17, and this is where he talks about, he says, then we who are alive and remain, again, there's that final generation. Some of us are going to be alive when that event takes place. We'll be caught up, that word rapture there, uh, together with them in the clouds and to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. And so that's the event called the rapture. But then you notice verse 18, he says, therefore, based upon all that I've said, comfort one another with these words. And uh, so this is something, he says, I don't want you uninformed. It comes straight from the Lord. Here's how it's going to happen. And it's supposed to be a comfort to the believers. Sadly, you and I live in a day, a time period where much of the church world does not talk about this. 
And so where Paul says, I don't want you uninformed, we, we can find ourselves very uninformed. Does that make sense? So then in chapter 5, what comes after the rapture, he goes and he describes the tribulation period. He says, this is not supposed to catch you by surprise. And so we looked at that when we were there, and we followed that all the way down. But I'm going to pick up chapter 5 and verse 9, and he says, for God has not destined us for wrath. We're not going to be part of that tribulation period, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. So uh, he's talked about all of these end times things that are going to take place. And he says, but you're, you're not going to face that wrath. You're going to be rescued from that. But then you go to verse 11. And the first word in verse 11 is the word, therefore, therefore. How many of your Bibles have the word therefore? Now, some of your Bibles might have the word wherefore, which is the old King James way of saying therefore. That's how they said that 500 years ago. Therefore, therefore. When you see the word therefore, you always want to stop and say, what is it there for? And when Paul says therefore, it's his way of saying, based upon everything that I've said up to this point, uh, here's what you need to know. And what we're going to find here is that based upon everything that he said up to this point, he's going to say, now, this is how you, us, as believers, are, are, are to live this out. And uh, I'm going to suggest that to the church that he's written all about the end times when he says, therefore, here's how you live this out. This is going to be to the church, uh, we would say, that is actually in the end times, and we would say that, that very, very uh, last generation. So verse 11, he says, therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. So when he says that, it's important to note that what he's saying is preventative, not curative. Preventative in the sense that he just wants to make sure that they, they, they continue doing that He's not correcting them. They're, they're already doing this, but he sees something that if he doesn't warn them, they, they might find themselves drifting away from what it is that he's saying. So this is going to be how believers are to live, and the rest of the chapter is going to be in that, in that last days, the, in the end times. There's so much to say in this, and every line could be a, a, a standalone sermon. So the big question is, what do you leave in and what do you, what do you leave out? But uh, we're going to look at just a couple of verses today uh, that um, will deal with more of the practical way of living this out. And then next week, as hopefully we wrap up this chapter, we're going to deal with the supernatural aspects of our faith. And uh, so there's, there's a lot here. Now, as we get into this, this passage, it's important once again to remember who it is that Paul is writing to. When Paul writes to certain groups, he says certain things. And understanding who he's writing to helps us understand why he's saying this. So when we, we consider who it is that Paul is writing to, you will recall uh, from several teachings back that Paul came to this town of Thessalonica. And there on your, your outline in the book of Acts, it said it like this. Some of the Jews, he went to the synagogue and began teaching there. And it says, some of the Jews were pers persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did, and I've underlined, a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. The majority of the people in this church are going to be referred to as God-fearing Greeks. They had not converted to Judaism, um, but, but they were God-fearing at this point. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Some of the people who were there at the synagogue who came from a Jewish background believed, but most of those who believed were God-fearing Greeks. Now, in chapter 1, it gives us another detail, and I put it there in your outline. He says to them, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So this church, by and large, they began as idol worshipers. They went to the pagan temple. Somewhere along the way, they became disillusioned with what they were experiencing there 
at that pagan temple. They looked on and they saw something about the Jewish people and the God that the Jewish people were following. And they realized that the, the Jewish people talked about a God who actually cared about his people. And they had a book, they had scriptures, and those scriptures, their God had given them, taught them how to live wise and, and prosperous lives. And this God wanted to see his people do well. When they worshiped idols, you've heard me say before, those gods didn't actually care uh, about you when you went there and you, you brought your sacrifice. Uh, you, you went there to sacrifice to those gods, not because they cared about you, but you were concerned that if you didn't sacrifice, they would destroy your crops. And, and you felt that maybe if you sacrificed enough, maybe, just maybe, those pagan gods might actually do you a favor. This was very different than the God that the Jewish people were worshiping. The, the God that the Jewish people worship was concerned about his people. So by the time that Paul arrives there in Thessalonica, these God-fearing Greeks are no longer worshiping the pagan gods. They're there and they're worshiping, we would say, the God of the Bible or the God of the Jewish people. They haven't converted to Judaism because converting to Judaism meant undergoing a certain um, surgery that they weren't ready to do. And I think you'll agree that there's a reason why you do that on the eighth day and not when you're 30 years old. Does, does that make sense? So, so uh, but they're God-fearing. They're worshiping, but they're not fully, fully converted. So a large number of them respond, and Paul shows up, and he See, they're learning about this God and he fills in the details and he talks about here's this Christ, this Messiah, this Savior, and uh, he came to save. And, and so they respond. They respond to the gospel. And as they respond to the gospel, their experience is going to be very different than what they had at the pagan temple. So as we begin this last part of this last chapter, one of the things that we want to highlight, there's something that's woven through this book. We've mentioned it several times. I want to highlight it just one last time. But unlike going to the pagan temple, and you want to write this down, the church is a family. You want to write that down. And uh, Paul is going to emphasize that throughout this book. So if you would, uh, just hop, skip, and jump with me. I, I want you to underline every time you come to the word brothers or brethren, so in verse 12, he says, we request of you, brethren. You go down to verse 14, we urge you, brethren. And then you skip over to verse 25, he says, brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with the holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter written to all the brethren. So Paul is emphasizing in this church, in this letter, that it's a whole different relationship. When Paul went there, there in your outline, he says, we, we proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother. Uh, another time he says, we exhorted you and encouraged you, uh, each one of you as a father. So Paul is, is in this letter always using these family terms. Uh, he's driving that point home. He never says, I came to you as a general. He, he doesn't do that. It's, it's always about family. Now, as we talk about this today, uh, being part of the family. Keep in mind that this was very foreign or very new to the Thessalonians. Now, we grew up in church, many of us, so we're, we're just accustomed to this. But this was brand new to them. When they went to the pagan temple, they weren't connected to other people who went to the temple. They went there, they gave their sacrifice, and they went on their way. They weren't doing life together. They weren't in groups together. They didn't have picnics together. They, they just went there and did their, their sacrifice, and then they left. So Paul, as he describes this relationship as a family, and he uses the term brother, 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 brethren, 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 uh, it implies that they had a common parent. And so in chapter 5, you'll recall from last time, he says, for you're all sons of light and sons of day. And so he describes them as sons of light, sons of day. Uh, and we would know that as sons of God. And, and that's uh, a certainly a conversation. Hopefully, we can talk about, talk about more. 
So in this book, which is all about the end times, Paul emphasizes their family relationships. Now, as he begins talking about their family relationships, the first thing that he wants to do is, as a family, he wants to share family. This is how you are to treat your pastors. Okay? So, um, so we're going to pick it up in verses 12 and 13 as he highlights that. So in verse 12, he says, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. And then, then he says, live in peace with one another. And you want to underline that, live in peace with one another. You and I, we live in a day where uh, our world tends to erode the esteem of, of the pastor. Uh, when you, when you, uh, you watch any show and there's a pastor there, uh, the, the pastor is never portrayed as a guy who just wants to love his wife and his kids and, and be a good person and, and represent the Lord. There's always in every show, uh, there's always this uh, distorted evil side of the pastor. Does that make sense? Uh, and, and have you noticed that every movie about the rapture of the church, who is always left behind? It's the pastor. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> always, always. And, and, and you know, so, so there is in this, in this culture, in this world, there is this uh, diminished respect and esteem uh, of the pastor. My, my aunt uh, used to say to me, because, uh, you know, she didn't think much of those in the ministry, but she would say, she said, you know, Danny, if you can't do anything else, you can always go in the ministry. <laughs> because in her mind you know, anybody in the ministry was just a complete idiot. And, and uh, you know, they, they weren't smart and, you know, whatever. And I, I want to encourage you guys, be very careful around your children how you speak about the pastor. Uh, some of us grew up in families where we would drive home every week after church and the parents would talk about, that guy's just such an idiot. He doesn't know, why does he do that? And, and uh, we do that for years. And then one day our kids grow up and they don't go to church. And you go, why don't you go to church? Well, because we have so deeply impregnated into their subconscious mind that the pastor's an idiot anyway, so he doesn't have anything to say. Be very, very careful. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so, um, you, you want to keep that in mind. Now, now, there's something else that we have to talk about, and this is where this gets awkward. Um, we want to keep in mind that the context that Paul is writing in, the church is only about six months old at this point, and there in your outline, I've put it, when they became believers, uh, that meant severe suffering there in, on your outline from 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, and then uh, another way of saying it uh, would be through much tribulation and uh, then Paul in chapter 2 says, you endured the same sufferings. So Paul is writing to this church, and they're about six months old. The church is growing. People are getting saved, but there's persecution, and uh, terrible things are happening to people in the church. Well, the, the reality is that their church leadership had never navigated through persecution, you know, six months ago, they weren't even believers, but, but now there's persecution and terrible things are happening. And everybody in the congregation has a viewpoint as to how the leadership should handle that, that persecution. And so Paul wanted to write to make sure that people didn't become so polarized because the leadership of the church wasn't handling the persecution in the right way. When... Um, one of my favorite stories 
um, is um, when you go to seminary, you, one of the classes you're going to have to take, you're going to have to take about a year of church history. Church history is this fascinating study because you realize when you take church history that God has to be in the church because no other organization, organization could make as many stupid mistakes uh, as the church has made through the years and still be in business. Uh, it's just, it's amazing. But one of my favorite stories is early on, you know, the, the, when the Roman Empire was there and the, the, the believers, w- would, they would take the letters from Paul and John and they would write their own copies of those and so they would have those and they considered those to be scripture and they were very dear to the believers. Well, the Romans realized that the Christians had these copies, handwritten copies of their scriptures and, and so they made those illegal. So they would send the Roman soldiers to the houses of the Christians, and they would say, you give us your copies of the scriptures, those handwritten things, and if you don't, we're going to come in, we're going to arrest you, we're going to tear down your house, and we're going to take them. And uh, so, so they would do that. Well, the Christians, many of the Christians, they realized that Roman soldiers, by and large, in that day, they were illiterate, and, and so they couldn't read. So the Romans would show up and they'd knock on the door and say, you give us your scriptures right now or we're going to arrest you and feed you to the lions and all that. So they say, okay, well, you got us. So they go back in their room and they get their copy of Life magazine and the <laughs> Palm, Palm Beach Post and some other things that were written. And they walk out and say, all right, you got us here. Take them. And uh, the Romans would take them. And then they go and they burn them. They burn them. And um, now that's how they handled that. Now, on on the other hand, other Christians looked on and they said persecution showed up at your door and you're a coward, you're a tradator, you're a traitor, and they called them the tradadors because you didn't accept persecution when it showed up on your door, you know, you totally bowed, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, you, you ran from that. And uh, so the question is, and so that, you know, they thought that you weren't really much of a Christian as you did that. And if you want to know where I stand on that, if they just showed up at my door, I would have given them my copy of Life magazine and the Palm Beach Post. I, I would have done that. So, so should they have taken the persecution or should they have done what they, they did? Well, here's the outcome. We have some ancient manuscripts, very ancient, because somebody decided they weren't going to give up their scriptures and so they gave them something else. So, um, you know, which one was right? Well, I'm grateful that some did not give up their scriptures because now we have a, a, some authoritative texts from, that are very, very ancient. Does, they, does that make sense? Yeah. So Paul knows that this church is going through a very difficult time. Part of esteeming the leadership is recognizing that, guys, they, they've never faced persecution again. So they're trying to figure, they're trying to figure it out. And there's lots of opinions on how you navigate through that. Today, as we live in the end times, and I want to be very careful about what I say, but in our world, we are facing a pandemic. And um, there are strong opinions as to how you are to handle that. Here at, at Calvary, we have chosen to be open. And, uh, you know, we've not said we're going to social distance. If you want to social distance, if you want to wear a mask, fine. You're adults. Do that. But I can tell you that we are open. And apart from tanks rolling up, we're always going to be open from this point forward. Okay, you you don't know what I'm going to say next, though. (laughs) Many of my pastor friends who I love, and they love me, and they love us, and they would do anything for this church as we would do anything for their church. As they are praying and as they are trying to figure this out, Um, they have decided to stay closed. And we have had good conversations. I think you should be open. 
And uh, so, you know, we're, we're all trying to figure this out. And um, so all of us, all of us, and thank you for, for uh, esteeming, all of us in this, from people in our churches, we have all, whether we're open or we're closed, we have been receiving some less than fully encouraging emails uh, because we're not doing it the right way. So my friends who are closed because they feel like that's the right way, people are writing to them and they're saying, you have no faith, you're not a true Christian, you're you know, on and on and on. We've decided to be open. So the emails that come to us is you're irresponsible, terrible things are going to happen. So no matter what you do, some, somebody is going to be bothered by it. And, and so we, we have this, and, and I'm with a group of pastors, and we are having these Zoom meetings, and we talk all the time, and we're sharing some of the things that are being said, and they go, well, Dan, what are you saying to these people who are saying that you're irresponsible and you shouldn't be open? I said, it's easy. I just tell them to go to your church. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go to their church. We'll take you when everything opens up. So, so here, here's the thing. We have a theological, a theological perspective. We believe, I believe, I believe in the Jesus who says, you lay your hands on the sick and they recover. I believe in the Jesus who says, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you. I believe in the God who in Psalm 91 says, that, that you're the one who rescues us from the deadly pestilence. Uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid of the terror by night, the air by day, the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. I, I believe in the God who says that no plague will come near our tent. And, and so I believe that. I believe that. And, and I wish my friends believed that too, uh, or at least the way that, that I do. But I want us to be very careful that we don't get so polarized that we forget that nobody has walked through this before. So you want to be very, very careful and have lots of grace with people who maybe don't see it our way. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, well, good. You can applaud for that. Which is why I think at the end of verse 13, he says, live in peace with one another. Have you ever been in a church where there's differing opinions and those things become very antagonistic and you know, so anyways, think that through. So uh, to the church in persecution, he says to the, you know, as far as the leadership is there trying to figure it out, verse 14, he's going to say, now here's how I want you to be towards one another. He says, but we urge you brethren, he's going to keep highlighting that, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Underline that, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another, and I've underlined one another, and for all people. So to the church that's in persecution, you don't want to lose sight of the fact that they're going through a tough time. They're being persecuted. He says, so here's how you need to live with one another. And, and this, again, this is for the brethren. This is not for the pastors. This is for, for us, how we're to relate to one another. There are three groups here that just need to be loved as family. So first of all, he says in verse 14, he says, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Now, that's an interesting word, unruly. Uh, a tactos in the Greek means disorderly. It's translated as idle, lazy, or disorderly in other places. And it's the, the idea of somebody who's disorderly or disruptive, divisive, you and I are facing a situation because of our opinions. If we're not careful, we can become very divisive within the church. And uh, he says, uh, you need to have those conversations when, when people do that. But I want you to notice something there. My, my translation says to admonish, but some of your translations will say warn or admonish. And it means to caution or reprove gently. Everybody underline the word gently. These are brothers and sisters in Christ, and uh, they're, they're drifting, uh, they're becoming disorderly, and there, there's reasons why that word is translated different ways, and we'll look at some, and we'll get into 2 Thessalonians. So number one, you want to write down, 
We need to lovingly have the hard conversations with the spiritually disobedient. To the church of, that's in the end times, uh, he says, uh, you know, it's, you, you need to have those conversations. A, as a church, and you tell me if this is true, we're very quick to protest unbelievers because they don't act like believers. But many times believers who aren't acting like believers, we don't say anything. But we need to lovingly have those conversations to bring them back along. So we need to confront those who are spiritually disobedient with love. And then number two, you want to write this down. Um, we need to encourage the faint-hearted, struggling with discouragement. Verse 14, he says, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted. And that's an interesting word. It's a compound word in the original language. And uh, it's, it's just uh, the idea is that they're, they're discouraged and they're, they're not bold in this time. Keep in mind this church is going through a time of persecution. They're losing their jobs. They're losing family members. They're concerned about being arrested. You and I live in a time where, the, in this time, where many believers are going through a, a difficult time. They're afraid. They're, they're losing their jobs. They're losing their homes. Terrible things are, are happening to them. And uh, they need encouragement. They need, they need some encouragement. They don't need a drill sergeant. So encourage those who are going through this difficult time. And then number three, very quickly, he says that um, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, help the weak. And uh, that's an interesting thing. So you, you want to write down help the weak just means meet needs. That word weak is, is an interesting word because it has so many possible meanings. It can mean strengthless. It can mean moral weakness. It's interesting that six months ago, these people in this church, many of them were, were they, they, they come from a very different moral background. And uh, so now they're believers. And they might not be just yet where they need to be morally as believers. And uh, so they're, they're going to need to be some help getting there. Feeble, sick, without strength. And uh, so for some, it's economic. They're exhausted. And so don't, don't just encourage them. Help them. Come alongside and help. And so the idea is Paul wants to remind us we're family. And, and this is how we live this out as, as family. I love that he finishes that, and hopefully you underline, he says, be patient, be patient. Would you agree that not everybody grows spiritually at the rate that you want them to grow? How many of us are like me? I always thought that by this time in my life, this time in my spiritual journey, I'd have it a little bit more together than I do. I'm the only one, right? <laughs> now we're all there, we're all there. So, so let's be patient help people grow and encourage them. Verse 15, as we wrap up, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Very quickly there on your outline, one another is inside the church. All people are those outside the church. It's easy to get into attack mode when you're under pressure and you're under persecution or you're in a situation like we're facing. So Paul says, here's how I want you to live this out very practically. And next week we're going to continue on, but we're going to look at the supernatural aspect of our faith. As we close today, I, I want to just say one, one more time, and I'll probably always say that. You and I live in a time where you do not want to go in this time and be in this time and not know that you know that you know that you have received God's plan of salvation, you've entered into that relationship, you've received salvation, that you are right with God. You need his wisdom to live in this time, and you need that relationship for all eternity. As I close in prayer, if you've not invited Jesus into your life, you have that opportunity. Join me as uh, we close in prayer. Father, as we wrap this up today, we pray that you would help all of us to represent you in this very strenuous time where a lot is going on and difficulty is facing us. We see birth pangs taking place. And uh, so we, we want to represent you well. And we know that if we're not careful, we can go this way or that way. And so help us to walk 
with you in just the right way. For those of us who've never invited you into our lives, we've never accepted your gift of salvation, right now we say, Jesus, come into my life. Give me your forgiveness. I want to belong to you. And as I go forward today, I'm going to follow you as best I know how, and I pray that you reveal yourself to me as I go. The Bible says that if you open your heart to him and he steps in, he saves you, and then he promises that he will never leave. And if that's you today, make sure that you tell somebody, let us know on a connection card, stop by the the welcome tent on the outside, let somebody know, or let somebody know that you're here with, or if you're online, let us know so that we can help you get started in your walk with the Lord. Father, I pray that you keep each and every one of us till we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, Amen. amen. Love you guys. See you next time. Thank you for joining us for service today. We hope you found today's message encouraging. If you haven't completed your connection card, please do so. You can use the link above on our website or use the link in the comment sections on our other platforms. During this time, many of us are connected more online and we want to encourage you to share our Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram accounts. You never know what a simple invitation can do. Calvary, we miss you and we look forward to seeing you soon.